Hey, CF family, thank you for joining us today. We really hope that this message encourages you and blesses your life. Well, before you hear this powerful teaching, I want to encourage you to share this message with someone who needs to hear the gospel. You never know what this message can do to the life of that person. Also, we want you to know that wherever you're watching us from, you can still impact the lives of others through your giving. It is through your generosity that we can keep pushing the kingdom of God forward in our city and all over the world. Giving is safe and simple. You can go to our app or you can go to our website, cfmiami.org slash give. Well, God bless you and I hope you enjoy this message. Hey, how many of you believe that God, our God, is a God of revival? Do you believe that, church family? Come on, let them hear right now. Amen. Hey, it is great to see you all. Man, what a great day to worship God together. Amen. My name is Omar, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving as a lead pastor here at Christ Fellowship. Uh, and if you're joining us today for the first time at one of our campuses, perhaps uh, at Doral, Coral Gables downtown, West Kendall, uh, Redland Homestead, or here at Palmetto Bay, hey, can we welcome our first time guests who are joining us? Man, it is so good to have you here with us. Uh, in fact, today we are starting a brand new series called Skeptics Welcome. And uh, it's a series that we, it's more of an apologetic series. Uh, it's going to launch off a, about a year-long study through the book of Genesis. And uh, we're going to be answering some of the hard questions that not only skeptics have about the Christian faith, but if we could be honest, some of us here today who are believers, who've been walking with the Lord for a long time, even we have some of those questions as well. And today we're going to be answering the question, does God even exist, right? It has to start with that. And so if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And wherever you find yourself online at one of our campuses, you can follow along with me as I read, all right? Listen to what God's Word says. It says this. In the beginning, who? God. Who? God. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in the book of Isaiah... God tells us this, come now, come now, my children, come, Christ fellowship, come, all you skeptics, all you skeptics, listen, let us what? Reason. Reason together, says the Lord. In other words, the Lord welcomes you to come and ask all the questions you want, even the hard questions, the hard, why questions of the Christian faith, amen? That is God's word. You can go and take a seat, everybody, at all campuses. And folks, let me start off by sharing with, with, uh, this with you. Uh, many of you know that Ashley and I, we have two beautiful children. And uh, one of them is Mateo, who just turned one. Yeah, this is our, uh, at home we tried, made a, made a little uh, a place for to take some photos. But he was a little afraid of the cake. I, this is the reality right here, yeah. Running away was kind of challenging, but man, we've been blessed with Mateo. He's just growing up so quick. And, but we also have a three-and-a-half-year-old, and her name is Camila. And uh, she is growing up so fast, and she is just uh, the funnest, little spunkiest girl. And we just always have so much fun with her. But folks, follow me here, because Camila is in a stage where she's asking a lot of why questions. You all remember when your kid had those, that season, the, a lot of why questions? She asked questions like, Dad, why do we put you know, butter on the bread? Daddy, why do I, why do I have to, you know, why do I have to put shoes on? Well, Daddy, why is the sky blue, right? All these sorts of questions. And here's what's interesting. Child psychologists say that children in this state, in this, in this stage, ask between 200 and 300 questions a day. A day, yeah, a day. And folks, they don't ask these why questions to annoy parents, but it's actually designed by God, hardwired by, the, by their creator to want to ask these why questions. In fact, last time we took Camila for, for the annual checkup before school started, one of the questions that the doctor had for us was, is Camila asking a lot of why questions? Because that shows that she is progressing and she is developing normally. 
And folks, those why questions, it's a sign of her wanting to know the world around her. If wanting to her to know why things are the way they are. And here's why they, they ask these why questions is because the more they ask these questions, the more secured and the more confident they will be. And so me as Camila's earthly father, listen, when Camila comes to me and she asks me all these random questions, listen, I welcome those questions because I know that the more that she asks, even the hard questions, listen, not only is she going to be more secure in her life, but she will also be more confident. She'll be more secure and confident, not only in this life, in the way she lives this life, but also in her relationship with me, with her early father. Folks, let me just bring that over to our time together as we open up God's Word, because what an image of our Heavenly Father, right? And, and, and by that I mean that just like me, Camila's earthly father, listen, I welcome, right? I welcome all those questions, even the skeptical questions, right? Just like that. And here's the big idea as we open up God's Word. Listen, our Heavenly Father, our Creator God, Listen, he welcomes all of our questions. He welcomes all of our questions, even all those of us who may be a little skeptic about the Christian faith. Why? Because he knows that the more we get answered these hard why questions, the more secure and the more confident we will be, not only in our day-to-day -day life, but also in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen? And who knows, maybe you're here right now watching for the first time. Maybe you're one of our campuses, your first time guest, or starting coming, and you're trying to figure out. And the reality is that you have some, some questions of, yourself, of, of your own. Maybe you've been here for a long time, and you still have questions. And sometimes there's something about us that we feel that when we ask God these hard why questions, it may seem like we're trying to defy God, but listen, he actually welcomes all of those why questions. And so today, as we start this brand new series, Skeptics Welcome, uh, we're going to be answering, like I said, all, a lot of these why questions, not only, get this, not only in our weekend service, right, in our, in, in our weekend service, but also in our small group Bible studies. And so if you have not joined a small group, listen, today is the day our small groups are starting off this new series this week, and so you've got to be part of a small group, Okay. So let's go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1, and let's get ready to dive into God's Word. You can pull up your apps and your listening guides. And today, I have three thoughts for us about who God is and some of the hard questions. So write this down as point number one. Here's the first thing we need to know, and that is that God welcomes skeptics who question His existence. Now let's go to the passage for today listen to what it says. It says, in the beginning, what? God. God. Stop right there and let's, let, let's set up the scene for us today because the question of whether or not God exists has to be one of the most fundamental or even the most basic questions that we have as humanity. In fact, many, if not all, of the questions that we have about things in life go all the way back to whether or not God exists. And here's the thing, it's quite natural for us to ask questions, it's quite natural for even for us to have some doubts about God. But let me, let me remind you, listen, we all have a moral and an intellectual responsibility to examine our faith so that we can be firm in what we believe, amen? And so my desire, my dream of Christ Fellowship is that not only believers come together to learn more, but even those of us who may be a little skeptical, who are interested in the Christian faith, that we can all learn together. Amen? What a wonderful place that, that could be. And so listen, here's the good thing. Write this down, letter A. And that is that God welcomes skeptics seeking truth. Again, I love that God's Word tells us Listen, come now, let us reason together. Reason together, says the Lord, because God wants us to seek truth 
but through him, right? He wants us, he wants us to reason together. Now, there was a moment in our history uh, where humanity, thinking that they were becoming wiser, actually strayed from seeking truth. And this took place during the Enlightenment era in the 1600s and 1700s, oddly enough called the Age of Reason. And I want to give us a little bit of some knowledge about this era because it's really shaped the way a lot of people think today and the questions that skeptics have. And so let me just give you some notable figures from that era. The first one is Rene Descartes. And Rene Descartes was somebody who actually began with good intentions. He, he wanted to affirm the Christian faith, but the route that he took was that he wanted to doubt everything that he encountered. And so he approached everything in life with doubt, and unfortunately, that ushered in an era of doubt and skepticism. The second person I want to cover today is this man called David Hume. And David Hume took the same thoughts from the Cardis, and so what he mainly taught was that we can only be certain of the things that we can touch and see. If we cannot touch and see, then those things we cannot be certain of. And that began, ushered that type of mentality. And then Immanuel Kant, who many of us have heard, took on the thoughts of both Hume and the Cardis, and so he began to, to teach that if there is a God, if there is a God, listen, we will never know him. He is unknowable. We can never know if a God exists and he, if he does exist, who he is and his character and his desires. And folks, here's what Kant began to teach. Here's how he came to this. In his mind, there were two a view, uh, two realms of reality, so to speak. One of them was the phenomenal reign, uh, um, uh, realm, which is what he called it, the phenomenal. And the phenomenal is everything we see around us, right? Like you touch your clothes, your, the chairs, the book, everything physical, that it was the phenomenal reign, uh, realm. But there was another realm, which was the noumenal realm. And this noumenal realm, what he characterizes is as unknown reality. That there might be another realm, but the reality is that there's no way to really know anything about it. And, 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 so, and so that ushered in the whole thought of, since we really can never be sure or certain about what, uh, what's in the noumenal, and if there's a God, then why bother seeking that? Only seek that, those things that we can physically touch and see. And family, this type of mentality has plagued humanity ever since. Because there's so many people today in society that they only care about the things that they can maybe touch and see, but they don't even bother to seek anything else further than that because in their mind, listen, truth and God is really unknowable. And so why bother even pursuing the things of God? That's things for people who are, you know, foolish people. Can I tell you, listen, even when I talk to my dad, who's not a believer in Christ, I can see a lot of this mentality in his mind because he's so focused on everything in this world but when I asked him about God, he could accept that there's something out there, but that we will never really know, so why bother spending all of our time and energy pursuing that? And if you could be honest, if you talk to your friends and family, or maybe you're here, some of us know people who don't bother pursuing anything other than things that they touch and see. But folks, here's what God's Word says. Uh, it, it, God's Word tells us, write this down, letter B. And that is that God rewards skeptics who seek truth. In fact, God's word says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For, who, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he what, church? What is it? Yeah, that he rewards those who seek him. You see, contrary to what men like Kant and Hume 
said, listen, that God of the universe, the self-existing one says, listen, if you seek me, there is a reward. And that reward is finding me. In fact, listen to what God says in Jeremiah 29. He says this, listen, you will seek me and you will find me. I'm, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your what? With all of your heart. And listen, can I encourage us with something as we seek the Lord in this series? My desire is that we seek this with a sense of humility. Because God, remember this, God is not obligated to give us proof about his existence. In fact, God could have created us and never revealed anything to, to us and still be perfectly good and just. Listen, just like a carpenter does not have to give proof to his woodwork about his existence, God does not have to prove to humanity that he exists. Amen? But here's the wonderful thing. Here's the wonderful thing. In his grace, he does. Amen? In his grace, he does. In fact, write this down as big number two. Listen, the invisible God gives us visible proof that he exists, that he exists. Now, we're going to start covering what we call general revelation. Everyone say general revelation. Yeah, general revelation. Now, there's two types of revelations, general and specific revelation. Later on in this series, we're going to look at specific revelation, but today we're only going to cover general re revelation. And there's two components of general revelation, and here's the first one. God gives us proof through the created universe. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the what? The what? The what? Yeah, the heavens and the what? And the earth. Now, now, pause right there. I want you to start thinking critically about this. Because it's interesting that the first thing that God, God's word tells us is not that God tries to beg us and tries to convince us that he does exist. He just says he, in the beginning, God, because he is absolute reality. But the first thing that he mentions in verse, that first verse of the Bible is actually the proof of his existence, which are the heavens, the cosmos, and the earth. In fact, listen to what God's word says about, uh, uh, in Romans chapter one about the importance of God stating the heavens and the earth after he reveals himself. Listen to what it says. It says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without what? Without what? Without excuse. And so don't miss this, because the first thing the first thing that God says in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, according to Romans chapter 1, is the primary proof that he exists. And folks, listen, when we look at the created universe, when we look at the stars, at the sun, at the moon, when we look at the earth, at everything that God has created, there is undeniable proof of his power and of his divine nature. Amen? In fact, God's word says this in Psalms 19. I love this verse. It says, the heavens, the cosmos, what you see, listen, they declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Meaning every single day, when we look around to us, to the created order, everything is screaming at us that there is a God that exists. Amen? In fact, take a look.
Man, let's give a shout out of praise to God for that. I hope that blessed your soul watching that. And so here's what God's word is showing us. That when every single human being, when they stand before the God of the universe, and God looks tears right into their eyes, and they say, I just didn't know that you existed. The God of the universe will say, you have no excuse. Because every single day, the every created order, listen, has been telling you day after day, day after night, that there is a God who exists. Amen, church? Come on, let's give a shout of praise to God for that. And folks, not only does creation, everything we see every day reveal that God exists, but also write this down as letter B. Listen, there is proof also through a universal moral law and our conscience. In fact, listen to what God's word says. It says, for when the Gentiles, people other than the Jewish people, who, knew, who do not have the law, now mind you, this is referring to the Old Testament law. By nature, notice, by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the moral law is what? Is what? Is written on their what? On their hearts. You see, one of the arguments that so many atheists have against God, they'll say, well, if, if God exists, then how can he be so unjust? How can he be so cruel? But folks, they, ask, they fail to ask themselves, how do they know something's unjust? How do they know something is wrong? How do you know they know something is right? You see, throughout humanity, it doesn't matter what culture you go to, you'll hear phrases like, hey, don't take that from me, that's mine, don't steal that. Hey, don't harm me, I haven't done anything wrong to you, right? Hey, 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 fulfill your part because you promised me something. Is that, and because the reality is that across humanity, there's a set of basic moral standards in every single human being. And those people who say, I don't, I don't have those same uh, moral standards uh, like everyone else, the moment that you wrong them the next day, they'll call, out you, they'll, call out, they'll call out to you because you've wronged them in one way, shape, or form. Isn't that right? And folks, listen, someone must have, it's the one who writes, who sets the standard of the basic moral law. And so don't miss this because one of the proofs that God exists is that he imprints his own moral nature into our hearts and we instinctively know what's right, what's good, and what's just. That's why no one argues that 9-11 was wrong. That's why no one argues that the Holocaust was wrong. And folks, not only get this, not only does he imprint his moral law into our hearts, but this is amazing. He actually gives us a mechanism for us to realize when we violated that law. And that is what we called a conscience, a conscience. In fact, listen to how that verse continues. It says that they show that the work of the law, the moral law, is written on their hearts while they're what? You could do a little better than that, like what? And their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. And family, here's why general revelation is so important. It's because general revelation is sufficient to hold us accountable and culpable before God. And, and I, I want you to see this visually. First of all, right, creation, right, creation, everything we see around us proves that there's a God who exists. Doesn't matter what philosophy, what lofty thoughts, creation get, takes away all the excuse, there is a God who exists. But then, morality and the conscience that we have inside, 
Here's what happens. It, show, it reveals to us that we have sinned against God. You see, the reality is that when you look at God's word, it makes it very clear that every single one of us have fallen short of the, have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. See, the reality is that mankind, doesn't matter who it is, deep in the hearts of hearts, doesn't matter how, what they say, they know that there's a God. There's no, there, and they know that they have sinned and violated that moral law inside of their hearts. Every person knows that, that fact. Listen to what we deserve for sinning against a holy and righteous God. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. Is death. And the soul who sins shall what? Shall die. See, what God's word shows us is that because of our sin, what we deserve is eternal death because we've sinned against an eternal God. And so what we, humanity deserves for our sin, for violating the moral law, for sinning against a holy and righteous God is to spend eternity in a place called hell. And I know that's a heavy topic, but folks, that's the reality. What we deserve for our sin is to spend eternity apart from God. In fact, if you, may, if you have more questions about this topic, again, we're going to cover that in our small group series. So you have to join a small group there. We're going to answer even more of these questions. But folks, here's the amazing thing about God. That even though we have rebelled against Him, that we have sinned against God, Listen, what he should do is turn his back on humanity and walk away from, from us forever, but he doesn't do that, does he? In fact, not only does he come to us, but instead, write this down as big number three, the invisible God not only gives you visible proof that he exists, but that he also loves you. Amen? You know, going back to Immanuel Kant, this is where he went wrong. You see, for him... Only what could be certain, that they could be certain, is the things that we can touch and see in the phenomenal range. But what he failed to realize is that everything that he sees in the phenomenal range is actually proof that God exists. And here's what I love about God. Not only does he give us proof of that God exists, but he breaks through that barrier to show us that he loves us and wants a relationship with us. Amen? And you may be wondering, well, how does he do that? We'll write this down as letter A. Listen, the invisible God shows he loves you through his visible son. In fact, listen to what God's word says about Jesus Christ. He says he is the image of the what? Of the invisible God. See, it is through his son, Jesus Christ. Listen, that the Lord shows us that he loves us. Amen? And you may be asking, well, how can Jesus be the, way, be the form, be the way that God shows me that he loves me? Because I have so many things going on in my life right now. How could it be that this man who lived 2,000 years ago was the one, the way that God shows us that he loves us? Well, listen to what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, while we were in our sin, while we were rebelling, while we were in our shame, listen, listen to what it says, Christ died for us. Amen. You know, sometimes these powerful scriptures, we may need to make it more personal, more personal. And so listen to, just read this again, but apply it to yourself. It says, but God showed his love for me, say for me, for me. And that while I was still a sinner, in my shame, sinning against God, running away from God, Christ died for me. You see, the truth of the matter is that the primary way that God shows his love for you and me it's not through physical things like a brand new job, a car, a relationship, 
uh, your family, your children, a job promotion. Those are, those are wonderful things that God provides for us. But that is not the way that God shows his love for us. You see, the way that God reminds you that he loves you every day is by reminding you that he gave his son to die on the cross for your sins and for my sins. You see, when we think of that cross behind us, right, when we think of that cross at Calvary, listen carefully, listen, let that be a reminder that God loves you, that he loves you so much that he would rather see his son suffer on a cross and die a grueling death for your sins than to spend eternity without you. If you're someone today that you are a skeptic and you're thinking, you know, I don't know, listen, that is the sign of God's love for you. That while you were still a sinner, God gave his one and only son to die for you. And listen, that cross is also the sign that he wants a relationship with you, isn't it? That he wants a personal relationship with you. And how do you do that? Very simple. Listen to what John 3.16 says. It says, for God so loved the world. For God so loved you just the way you are. That he gave his one and only son. That whosoever would do good things in life. And then say that. That whosoever would do a ritual. To say that. That whosoever would fulfill traditions, to say that, that whosoever what? Believes. Whoever believes in him shall not perish for all eternity, but have everlasting life. See, the reality is that the way that you can start a personal relationship, not only with a God who exists, but the God who loves you, and who has a plan for your life is very simple, is by coming before him, confessing all your sins, and putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the moment that you do that, here's what he does. He forgives you of all of your sins. He adopts you as his son and daughter. And from that moment on, listen, you spend, now you start a personal relationship with God, with the God who loves you, with the God who exists, that will not only endure the rest of this life, but for all eternity. The question is simple. Will you put your faith in the Lord today? Let's bow our heads for prayer. My Lord, we are just so grateful, O oh Lord that you are a heavenly Father that welcomes our why questions, even the skeptical ones. And Father, even as we look around just throughout creation, Lord, it is undeniable that there is a God who exists. And the Lord, that we've all sinned before you, O oh Lord, but you in your mercy and grace have shown us your unending love for us through your Son. So thank you, Lord, for your grace. And with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, listen, there's maybe some of us here today uh, who the reality is that you are at a point that you want to start a personal relationship with God. And so in a few moments, if that's you, maybe I'm going to lead you through a prayer, but here's what I want to remind you of. When I lead you through this prayer, and put, talking to God, listen, you don't, you don't talk to me. You don't pray to me. I'm only a man. I cannot save you. You pray to the God who loves you and who gave his son for you because he's not waiting for you with crossed arms. He's, open, he's waiting for you with open arms. So if that's you, pray this with me. Father, today I realize not only that you exist, but, Father, that you love me. And so, the Lord, today I come before you with all of my sin, with all of my issues, with all of my trouble. And Lord, I confess all of my sins to you, O oh Lord. And I put my trust 
in the life, death, and resurrection of your son. Thank you, Lord, for sending him to die for me so that I could have life. And so, Lord, I come before you, O oh Lord, and again, I put my trust in you. I ask you for everlasting life, and for the rest of my life, help me to live a life that honors you, O oh Lord, as I walk with you, O oh Lord, in every season of my life. I thank you, Lord, today. It's in Jesus I pray, and all of God's people say, amen. Hey, can we encourage all of those who pray that prayer at all campuses? Listen, if that was you, man, I want to encourage you with something. Listen, in a few moments, we're going to all stand up and we're going to worship God to end the service, right? There's no better way than to end the service than to worship God. But if you pray that prayer for the first time, or maybe you're someone who's back from a long time and you feel like you need to recommit your life to Christ and start afresh, listen, I want to encourage you to do something that may take a little courage, right? And that is this, listen, when, as we are singing, I'm going to be down here uh, with, uh, with uh, my, I'm going to be right here, there's going to be other pastors, and as everyone is singing, singing, listen, I would love if you would just come out, come to the front, and give me an opportunity just to say hi to you, to just welcome you into our God's family. Listen, we have a brand new Bible that I want to give you with a couple things inside, and it'll be great to rejoice. And so listen, as we sing, Listen, let's, can we allow, can we allow people who want to come to the front to come in? Yeah? Can we do that? And so listen, in scripture, there's a story, there's a story about a lady, as Jesus was walking, that she touched the Lord and she was healed. Something happened in her. And you know what was going to happen? She was going to recede into the crowd. But the Lord said, no, no, come, come. And listen. As she came, she was able to take the step, and it was such an amazing moment in her life to say publicly, yes, I'm starting a relationship with Christ today. I'm committing myself to the Lord today. And so listen, everyone's going to be worshiping. It's going to be focused on, I mean, it's not to embarrass you, but come up to the front. I would love to say hi to you. We have some things for you, a brand new Bible. It's going to be amazing, right? So if that's you, come to the front. I would love to say hi to you, right? So let's go ahead and stand up together at across all campuses. And then I'll meet you here as we sing one last song. We sing, I will believe. For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Come on, let faith arise. Let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things, there's no power. Can we give it up for all these people who came to the front? God bless them. Listen, hey, if I can, if I can just get their attention really quick.
Well, actually, can you, walk, can you walk with them to the next step booth? They'll be at the next step booth if you came to know Christ. If they can to know Christ, you can just, on your way out, you can meet with them. Hey, can we praise the Lord? Amen for that. Amen. Well, listen, church family, it's been a great, great day. Listen, the angels are proclaiming, are celebrating in heaven. Amen. That there's people who've come to the feet of Jesus in faith in him. Listen, next week we're continuing this amazing series, Skeptics Welcome. I want to challenge you. Listen, if you know people in your life that need to be here, bring them with you. And I'm telling you, God is going to continue to do some amazing things. Amen. Next week, this week we talked about, we learned about this. God exists. Next week, we're going to learn that God actually created everything. And then why did he create this world? Is there a purpose for all this? We're going to find out next week, all right? God bless you, uh, folks. Have a great, great weekend. God bless.